<clears throat> Take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1. We're in the middle of a series called Becoming the People That God Has Created Us to Be, or Becoming. This has been a really good series. God's Spirit has been moving through the teachings and through the service and through your hearts. Thank you so much. So we're going to, um, the first week we looked at Nicodemus and we looked at what it means to truly be a Christian. What does it really cost? And we looked at Nicodemus's life and we answered the question or we're trying to answer the question. I've heard more about this sermon than any others, but are we a fan of Jesus or are we a follower of Jesus? Because there is a difference, a fan or a follower. And that's the first week. If you uh, missed that message, I highly recommend that you put your order in at the Welcome Center. They'll make a copy for you next week um, and listen to that. Or you can go online and listen to it. Then last week, we looked at what it means to be a people of mercy. It's God's desire that we become people, merciful people. And we looked at mercy and we looked at the woman who was going to be stoned. And Jesus said, you who have no sin, cast the first stone. And everybody dropped their stones. And we really looked at mercy and God desires for us to become people of mercy. And this week we're looking at what it means to be uh, transformed by the Bible. It is God's desire that you have his word hidden in your heart. David says, hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And it's God's desire that you have the word of God in your heart and in your mind and coming out of your mouth, coming out of your life. And we're looking at uh, keeping a biblical perspective. So you'll notice, um, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you'll notice that we have butterflies and caterpillars and it's all over the bulletin and signs. And what that is, is basically uh, God created a caterpillar, caterpillar to turn into a butterfly. It wasn't his desire that a caterpillar remains a caterpillar, but instead a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. And in the same way, it's God's desire that you uh, don't remain a caterpillar, <laughs> just joking, that you don't remain the same as you were last year or the year before that or 15 years ago. God wants you to grow. He wants you to transform into being the people and being the person that he wants you to be. And so we're using this as an analogy, kind of an example of caterpillars turning into butterflies. And guess what, everyone? We had caterpillars the first week. Last week, we had cocoons. And this week, we have butterflies. There's butterflies in here. Now, if I were to release these right now, they would be all over the place. And early on in the week or in the middle of the night, they might kick off the alarm sensors. And we don't want to do that. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, release them after service. Right after church, we're going to go outside and release these caterpillars and let them fly. So uh, until then, let's look at Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to break down really the sermon for you before, uh, for those of you that like to do a lot of fill-ins, 70% of this message is going to be before you even write one thing in the fill-in-the-blank, okay? This, I, this is going to be different. I've been talking to my wife about this and just saying, hey, this is more like a seminary class, okay? So it's going to be a little bit of history in this, uh, in this sermon and a lot of content but we just really, I'm asking that you put on your thinking caps and pretend as if you're in a seminary classroom and we're learning. And you say, well, how are we being transformed if it's going to be more of a teaching style? Because we need to learn to appreciate what this book is before we can get it into our hearts and begin to use it how it was intended to be used. And so if you can be patient, I'm going to teach probably 70% of this message uh, here before you even fill in blank number one. Uh, part two is developing the biblical perspective. We're looking at what is the Bible, and we're also going to look at why you and I should own, read, and memorize the Bible, and speak it, why we should own a Bible, why we should read it, and why we should memorize it, and then also how can we be transformed by the Bible. And again, 70% of this is going to be right up front. So uh, I'm going to give you a lot of different facts, and if I were to ask you this question, this is a rhetorical question, would you be able to answer this? Do you know how this book has come into being? Do you know how this book was designed and how it was created? Uh, do, do you know, or could you be able to articulate uh, why there are 66 books in this Bible, why there are 39 in the Old Testament, and why only 27? Does anybody know that? And it's rhetorical. 
And I've asked a few people of that uh, these last couple of weeks, and the majority of the answers are no. We read the Bible, and, and we study the Bible, and we preach out of the Bible, but the majority of people aren't even able to describe how this thing came into being. And so I want to answer that today, and I want to teach a little bit uh, so that you can be equipped and that you can know that what we're reading and what we are memorizing is the Word of God, and it's true, and we can bank on it. And so I'm going to teach a lot about this. Let's look in our notes, though. It says this. What is the Bible? This is a great quote. It's a big book full of big stories with big characters. They have big ideas, not least themselves, and they make big mistakes. It's about God and greed and grace, about life, lust, laughter, and loneliness. It's about birth, beginnings, and betrayal, about siblings, squabbles, and sex, about power and prayer and prison and passion, and that's only Genesis. <laughs> the Bible contains 66 books total. 39 of them are in the Old Testament. The Latin word for testament uh, it means covenant. And 27 books are in the New Testament. It was written by more than 30 people over the course of 1,500 years. Look at the next quote here. The Bible is the church's historical connection to Jesus and the apostles, and thus has the power to preserve the church from errors of doctrine and practice. Samuel Powell said that in a teacher's guide to understanding scripture. Uh, it has the power to preserve the church from errors of doctrine and practice. It has the power to preserve you. You are the church. I am the church. It has the power to protect what you believe and to preserve what you believe and to be able to defend what you believe. Are you able to defend why you believe what you believe? And so hopefully we're going to be able to answer some of these here this morning. And again, I just want to equip you so that you're stronger. And some of you might have some aha moments. I don't know if the Holy Spirit will grab a hold of us and 50 people will be down here at the altar. Or if this is more like a, a seminary class, either way, we're going to learn this morning. So, okay, misconception. There's a couple of misconceptions about Scripture and about the Bible. Uh, probably the most common misconception about the Bible is that it was written at one time that a couple of people sat down and they wrote out a bunch of scripture all at once within you know, a couple of days and they put it together and sent it off to the printing press. That's a misconception and that is not true. The Bible was written by about 30 different people and over the course of 1,300 years, it was a work in progress and it was being put together and then over the course of about 1,300 years, um, we have what we know as the Christian Holy Bible. So that's a misconception. Another misconception about the Bible here is that it was put together by a group of individuals that wanted all the glory. They wanted all the praise and they wanted to be popular and they wanted to be known, oh, I contributed to the Bible. And that's really a misconception because most of the people, especially in the New Testament, the authors that wrote these books in the New Testament died. They were willing to go to their death for what they believed and what they were writing down. They didn't need their name in lights. It wasn't popular to be known and associated with Jesus. It would cost you your life. And yet they still decided to write these books and to put these things and these accounts together, including Luke, which we're about to read here in a little bit. But they went to their death for it. And so that's a misconception. And then a really big mis misconception about the Bible uh, is that this is not the true Bible. Uh, there are hundreds of manuscripts and other scrolls and other gospels and that why do we believe that these 66 books is the real deal? There's so many other gospels out there. And so how do we even know that this is the real deal? Um, keep in mind, I don't know if you knew that, that there were hundreds of other manuscripts and other gospels that were not included in this Holy Bible. Uh, you can verify any of this and look it up and do your own research, but there, was, uh, there were other Gospels that were written. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Gospel of Thomas. That was written, the Gospel of uh, Thomas, uh, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Judas. These were all written. The Epistle of Barnabas, he wrote 
uh, an epistle, the Shepherd of Hermas. I don't know if you've heard of the Shepherd of Hermas, but that was a collection of writings about Jesus uh, or even the Gospel of Mary. There, there's another Gospel. If you do the research, there are lots of other manuscripts and Gospels that did not make it into this book. Does anybody know why we have this book and why? how, how come they didn't make that, I'm, make this book? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to learn about why they did that. What separated many of these accounts? Here's a word that I'd like you to write down that will help you understand why many of these other manuscripts and many of these other gospels were not included in the Christian Holy Bible. And it's the word Gnostic. Many of these gospels had a Gnostic influence and that's spelled G. N-O-S-T-I-C. G-N-O-S-T-I-C. They had a Gnostic influence. Most of these manuscripts and these Gospels, these other ones, they were known as rejected Gospels. They were all filled with Gnosticism. And the Gnostics are people that, here's the summary of them, okay? And you can do the research, but here's the summary of Gnostic. The Gnostic belief is that uh, flesh is bad and the spirit is good. And so knowing that the flesh is bad, uh, they rejected that Jesus was God incarnate. They rejected that Jesus or that God came in the flesh and lived in the form of Jesus and he was the son of God. Most of these manuscripts and gospels had Gnostic influences written all throughout them that Jesus wasn't who he said that he was. So if you look like the Shepherd of Hermas, it's a collection of writings. And if you were to read that, you would see lots of accounts about Jesus, but they didn't point to the fact that he is the son of God and he was God. And so, uh, and many other manuscripts and gospels had Gnostic influences. And so that is, um, and I'm going to go into this here in a little bit, but that is the primary reason why they didn't make it into the Christian Bible because of all that Gnosticism, uh, which is, uh, in today's term, nonsense, absolutely nonsense. So I want to tell you a story here of how this Bible and how this book came into being, and then we're going to get into Luke chapter 1. I want to show you something really interesting. So let me tell you a story. It's believed that in 312 AD, here's a guy who's an emperor. Uh, he, he was known as Constantine. I don't know if you've ever heard of Constantine, but in 312, Constantine had a vision uh, and he was a pagan ruler. In other words, he was absolutely a non-believer. He was a pagan ruler. He had a vision, like many people do, and he had a vision of Jesus, and Jesus was speaking. He said, basically, uh, conquer in my name. And this is a non-believer. He had a vision, and Jesus was talking to him, and Jesus said, conquer in my name, and Constantine's life was changed forever. Several years after that, in 325, um, what was going on in the empire the Roman Empire, is that there was a lot of division going on. Much like today, if you want to really debate and get into hot topics, all you got to do is talk about, what, politics and religion. And it will get everybody riled up and lots of debate. Well, it was also that way in 325. And being the, the Roman emperor, he, Constantine, wanted to unite the empire. He wanted to unite the land and unite the country. And he's thinking to himself, how can we unite the people? And he thought, you know what? Religion would be a great... If we can get on the same page with religion, uh, we can also create unity and peace amongst the entire empire. Now, keep in mind, at the same time, all these manuscripts and all these other gospels were going around. Uh, people were still talking about what it means to be a Christian. It's about 325 AD. So there wasn't a firm, settled conviction of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. You had all these Gnostic gospels. You had, of course, all these different gospels that we have here in the Holy Bible. So you had all these manuscripts, all these different teachings about what it means to be a Christian. And Constantine says, we need to get on the same page. And the, the Catholic Church or the Christian Church at the time needs to have one, uh, one belief and uh, a common document that we can believe and we can say is uh, the word of God. And so what Constantine does is he invites, uh, and it's called the Council of Nicaea, he invites about 250 different bishops and leaders, you might want to write that down, 250 bishops and leaders called the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And these are bishops. These are the pastors and the bishops of all the different Christian communities all across the empire. He invites them to Nicaea and he, they have a big conference and they try to form what they believe is common ground and what they believe is accurate scripture. 
What was accurate? What manuscripts should we believe? What gospels should we really pay attention to? And they have this huge conference, this huge brainstorming conference called the, Ni the Council of Nicaea in 325. And out of the Council of Nicaea, they use, and here's another word. I know you feel like you're in class right now, but here's another word that you want to write down. It's called canon. Okay, they use the canon and a canon is like a measuring stick or the criteria used to uh, decide what Gospels are going to be included. It's called the canon. And there's three criteria in the canon. There's three criteria that the Council of Nicaea and many other scholars uh, for several years after that used to create the Holy Bible. There's three criteria. One of them, the criteria, was the Gospels needed to have a geographical acceptance, widely spread in other words, uh, if there was like, let's just take uh, the Gospel of Thomas. If there was just the Gospel of Thomas over here in this city, and only a small group of people, really small, believed the Gospel of Thomas, but all the other empire didn't believe it, they didn't hear about it, they didn't know about it, uh, they would not necessarily include the Gospel of Thomas because a small group of people only believe in that, but the rest of the people didn't. They wouldn't recognize it, much like what you see today. You see these weird groups come out of left field and they say, well, we believe just this, and it's just them, and it's like in some hills of Minnesota, and there must be right, and, and, yet, and, and all of us must be wrong. Well, it's the same thing going on in 325. The geographical inclusion was important. And Constantine and the Council of Nicaea said, we need to make sure that the Gospels are geographically widespread, that the majority of the Christian community believes in this. The second criteria in this canon was called apostolic authorship. And this is a big one. This is who were the eyewitnesses to the actual events that happened with Jesus? Who were closest to Jesus when it happened? And we're going to really look at their Gospels and really look at their account. It's called apostolic authorship. And so if you look at the Gospels and if you look at the New Testament, you will see a lot of apostles writing. You'll see Peter in there, First and Second Peter. You'll see Matthew. He was a disciple of Jesus. John was a disciple of Jesus. You see James. Uh, you see all these. And then if you don't see other apostles, you see their closest friends of the apostles, like Luke and even Paul. Paul knew Peter, and he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And so it's apostolic authorship. A another way of putting this in today's terms is if you wanted to find out what happened at the baseball game last Friday night, um, would you, you want to either A, read about it in the newspaper or in a magazine, or would you want to talk to somebody who is actually there at the game? I don't know if you remember Kirk Gibson of the L.A. Dodgers. Do you remember that? Hitting the home run, and he was, had a hamstring cramp, and he went around the bases like this. Does anybody remember that play? All right, just me? Okay, fantastic. <laughs> if you want to find about what it was like to be in that stadium, you can either read about it today when it happened 25, 30 years later, or you could talk to somebody who is actually there at the game. What would you choose? I would rather talk to somebody who was actually at the game to find out what happened and what was the energy like and what was the sense of people. And so it's the same way with this. Apostolic authorship is the Council of Nicaea. They decided who were the people that were closest to the events, who were actually there. And we're going to pay attention more to their teaching than any other Gospels or any other um, manuscripts. And then the third criteria that the Council of Nicaea used and many scholars used is that it was what you could call non-contradictory. They wanted to make sure that the Gospels didn't contradict each other or that a manuscript saying that Jesus wasn't God contradicts with the gospel that says he was God. So those three criteria were used in the Council of Ni Ni Nicaea. Uh, the geographical acceptance, the apostolic authorship, and then they wanted to make sure that things were not non or contradictory to each other. They wanted to make sure they were similar. And so in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's called the synoptic gospels, and synoptic stands for similar or, you know, similar. So if you look at stories in Matthew and you look at stories in Mark, Luke, a lot of them are similar stories, and that is straight out of the criteria that they used. Okay, six years after the Council of Nicaea met, believe it or not, there was still a little bit of debate, but Constantine uh, calls upon Bishop Eusebius, and he says, Bishop, I'd like you to summarize what the council said and put together 50 original uh, documents or 50 original books, Bibles, that we can distribute to 50 different cities 
And we can say and begin to establish that this is the word of God. This is the Christian uh, Bible. And so Eusebius, Bishop Eusebius did this. And keep in mind, they didn't have computers back then. They didn't have a printing press. They didn't have uh, anything, that, a typewriter, anything that you can mass produce. If they were going to create 50 original Bibles, uh, it had to be handwritten. And so Bishop Eusebius did this with a couple of other, other uh, bishops. And they put together 50 original Bibles uh, that they distributed to 50 different cities. Over time, those Bibles were destroyed or they were burned or they were lost in time. Because, you know, like we all have different Bibles. Some of you have it on your phone. Some of you might have a couple of different Bibles at home. Uh, back in this day, there was one Bible for the entire uh, city. Uh, and that's because they had to handwrite these Bibles. So they had 50 different Bibles, and over time, they eventually got destroyed and pages were missing. However, there are believed to be two of those 50 Bibles that are still in existence today. One of them, does anybody know where one of them remains? One of them is in the Vatican. One of them is in the Vatican, and it has pages that are missing, and a couple of them are burned. And the other one is in a, in a British library with St. Catherine. It was found by St. Catherine's uh, Monastery. But there's two of those 50 Bibles still in existence today, even though they are uh, missing. It was 30 years after that that the early church adopts the New Testament. Uh, some argue that the Council of Hippo and the Council of Carthage uh, put together these as well. But look at this. Here we go. You say, wow, Jeff, that's a lot, right? That's a lot of information. But here's, here's the point. And then we're going to look one. It was a filtering process. What was widely known as the Gospels manuscripts, how can we get closer to the real truth? Well, we're going to get rid of the Gnostic influence. We're going to get rid of all that stuff that says Jesus wasn't God. All of those Gospels are out. So several of those Gospels didn't make it. Let's get more of a narrow focus. Let's include apostolic authorship. So the people, the eyewitnesses that were actually there, let's include them. And so just imagine this narrowing focus, this filtering process down to what is actual truth and what is actually divinely inspired scripture. And that's how we get the 27 New Testament books and also the Old Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, which included the Torah and Psalms and Proverbs. Luke chapter 1, verse number 1. We see how accurate this gets. Here we go. Luke chapter 1, verse number 1. Luke says this. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything that you were taught. So even before the Council of Nicaea, the gospel writers, they wanted to make certain that they had exactly what happened with the eyewitnesses. They wanted to make certain that it was the truth so that people could bank on it and people could believe on it, including Luke when he wrote this gospel. And so number one, here's your notes. You ready? The Bible is accurate. The Bible is an accurate document. Amen, everyone? It's an accurate document. Regardless of whether the Gospels were included, regardless of what other manuscripts, some, some Gospel, I won't tell you which one, let you research, research it for yourself. Some Gospels say that Jesus beat up a kid uh, when he was a teenager. There was a Gospel that said that. There was other Gospels that said uh, that Jesus was actually a very violent person. There's another, another Gospel that said that Jesus was in love. All of these different things that did not get included. Luke here, right here, he says, I want to make sure that I've created a detailed account so that you will know exactly what the truth is. And so uh, some people say, well, these early gospel writers that made it into the Christian Bible, they didn't include everything. They omitted Jesus getting angry. They omitted all these other things, and they didn't include what was really happening. And that's not true either. The early gospel writers included everything. They included the failures of the disciples. They included Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, doubting and saying, God, if there's any other way, please remove this cup from me. They included Jesus in his weak moment of the Garden of Gethsemane. Perhaps the biggest reason that, or the biggest uh, example that we can see why these gospels included everything is that 
um, if you look at the scripture, back in, back in the day of Jesus' times, uh, children and women were disregarded. They were basically just property. I'm sorry, women, but at this time, you're basically just property. And, you know, if you had children, great. Hopefully it's a boy. But anything else, you know, you're just property. And Jesus brought a lot of inclusion and a lot of validity to children and a lot of value to children and to women. If the gospel writers were not wanting to include everything, if you notice, who were the first people who found the empty tomb? It was women. It was women. And so a woman's word wasn't worth anything back in this time. If you sit as a woman, and I mean, this is the bad news, but if you sit as a woman trying to uh, make your case or trying to tell a story or to stand in front of the uh, Sanhedrin, which included the Sadducees and the Pharisees, if you were, were going to include and, and talk, they would basically dis discredit you. They would discard you. They wouldn't even think about it. So for the gospel writers to say that it was the women, it was Mary Magdalene, it was Mary, the mother of James, there was Joanna in there. These are the women that first saw the empty tomb. If they wanted to admit that and bring validity, they would have kept that out. But they didn't. They wanted to make sure it was accurate, and they put it in there, knowing that it would cause a lot of controversy, knowing that they probably wouldn't be believed. Luke still wanted to be accurate to what really happened. And so the gospel writers included it in there. The Bible, friends, is accurate. It is absolutely accurate. The Bible was written by eyewitnesses. It was critiqued by hundreds of bishops and scholars. Hundreds of manuscripts were filtered down and filtered out over many years to be totally accurate. The gospel writers themselves were willing to go to their death for the truth. And so we can bank on the fact that the Bible is accurate. Number two, the Bible is inspired. It is inspired. It is the inspired word of God. Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4, everyone. Hebrews chapter 4. And we're also going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. <clears throat> and then 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. Says this, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one in whom we are accountable. The word of God is alive. People who say this is just a historical document and nothing really comes about by reading it today, they're wrong. It's alive and it's powerful and it exposes. I heard one person say that I don't read the Bible. The Bible, has it reads me. If you ever really get into the Word, as we're reading the Bible, isn't it funny how the Bible reads us and it exposes us and it convicts us and we are called to memorize it and to use it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3 through 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I hope you have your Bible today. If not, you can listen along, but 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it, the Bible, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. All scripture is inspired by God. And that's a huge argument that many people believe, uh, say, or at least non-believers, they say, how can you say that the Bible is the word of God if men wrote it? If men actually penned it, how can you say God did it if men did it? Well, scripture tells us that God inspired these individuals to write down his words. I've had many people over the years of ministry just teaching. They come up in tears and they're just like, God just spoke to me today and I just, I need to change. And I just thank you, Pastor Jeff, or I thank you, Pastor Janet, or I thank you, preacher, for what you shared. And, and you know, God, that's how God speaks. He uses the Holy Spirit and he speaks through mouthpieces. He speaks through people to us. He also speaks through his word. It's inspired 
inspired. It's the living word of God, and that's how God speaks. So why should I own, why should I read, and why should I memorize scripture? Number one in your notes, it's the primary way that God speaks to his people. It's through his word. It is through his word. In Matthew chapter 4, verse, four, verse number 4, Jesus says, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I don't know if you've ever wondered, you know, why isn't God speaking to me? Why can't I hear God? Why does it seem like God is distant? Why does it seem like God doesn't care? Why does it seem like that God is silent? Does he even care about what I'm going through? Is he even speaking to me? And the answer is yes, he is speaking to you. He speaks to you every day. He will speak to you as much as you want him to speak to you. But it's through his word. It's through his word. And when we say that, when preachers say that or Christians believe that, you know, some people are like, amen to that. And some people are like, ah, you know, whatever. I've heard this before. But how bad do you want God to speak to you? The question would be, how much do we read and own and memorize scripture? Because that will answer that question. He is speaking. Listening to somebody requires that we have focused attention, though. Uh, we've got to be listening to God louder. We've got to allow his voice to be louder in our minds and in our ears than all the other voices. When trouble hits your life, what do you go to first, the TV or do you go to the Word? Do you go to a, a magazine or a self-help book or do you go to the Word? Uh, God speaks to us and th he uses his Word to do that. Have you ever been talking to somebody and, and you say, hey, are we, uh, are we on for lunch tomorrow? And they say, oh, man, I know the Padres didn't do well last night. And you're like, what? Did you even listen to what I, I was saying? Have you ever been talking to somebody and they're listening and they're like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. And you're talking and you're saying something and all of a sudden they said, oh, look at what she's wearing over there. Right. And you're like, were you even listening to what I was saying? Are we in some, right? Has that ever happened to you? Sure, it has. It, it requires focused attention to listen to somebody. Whenever you're talking to me or if I'm talking to you, we're focusing on each other hopefully and listening to what the other person says. When God is speaking to you, it takes focused attention. It requires us to, us to read and hear to what he is saying. And when we open up our hearts and our minds and shut out all those other voices, God speaks. But God's not going to compete with the TV. God's not going to compete with your phone. He's not going to compete. He is a jealous God. And when he speaks, he wants you to be paying attention. He's not going to compete with all the other stuff that's going on. How bad do you want to know what God says to you? Because it's in his word. But we've got to give focused attention to his word if we're going to hear God speak. Amen? Yeah, and that really separates the men from the boys. It really, it really separates how bad do we really want God? How bad do we really want to listen to what he says? It will be reflected in how much we read the scripture and how much we memorize it and how much we speak it. We either, and I know sometimes I've asked a few people, you know, why don't we listen why doesn't Jeff listen? Why don't I read the word more? Why don't, why don't you read the word more? If we were to take a poll, we would probably have a ton of different answers why it's hard for us to read the scripture uh, even more. I can tell you this, though, and if you agree with this, say amen. If you don't agree with it, it's okay, but uh, you're wrong. Um, just agree with this <laughs> if you believe this. One of the reasons why we don't read more scripture is we have too many other distractions. Amen. It's true. Yeah, we have too many other distractions. Another reason is we don't truly believe that we believe that we believe that this genuinely is the word of God. If we really knew that God was speaking to us, we would be in this book a lot more. And so if you need a fresh word from God, if you come in this morning and you feel like God isn't speaking to you or that he's distant or that you just don't hear what he's saying, my question to you, and I say it gently and I ask it very respectfully because I ask myself this the same question is how much are we in the word of God? Let's go to Psalms chapter 1. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 1, and I'll end with this, then we'll move on to number 2. Psalms chapter 1. If you've gotten to Proverbs, it's too far, it's in the Old Testament. If you go right down the middle of your Bible and just go to the left a little bit, there's Psalms. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 1. Certain versions, depending on which version you're reading. 
Oh, the joys of those who don't follow in the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law does he meditate day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water or along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season, whose leaves do not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. But not so the wicked. They are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the seat of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, but in his light, or in his law, which is the word of God, does he delight day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. And there's a catch at the very end of that. Whatever he does prospers. Is our delight in the word of God? Is our delight in the law of the Lord? Because you will be like a tree planted by rivers of water, and your fruit will be coming out of your life. And that is something that is hopeful. Number two, here, number two, why should we own, read, and memorize the word of God? Number two is because the Bible teaches us how to conduct our lives. The Bible teaches us how to conduct our lives. Psalms chapter 119, verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It gives you direction. The word of God teaches us how to live. It teaches us how to conduct our lives, what we should do. You know, there are many people out there, and I pray for them, and I know you do too, and you might be one of them. I think we all are, are some of these people at some point in our lives, but there's people with no direction. They have no direction in life. They don't get up with purpose. They don't get up uh, believing that God has them on mission. They go to work every day, and yes, they're smiling on the outside, and they say they're doing fine, but inwardly they are lonely. Inwardly they are lost. If you were to ask them, if you die today, do you know that you're going to heaven? They probably wouldn't be able to answer you. They don't know. They're wondering. They're lost. And you know, people are without direction these days more than ever. And I know on the outside it appears as though they don't because everybody, it's all about the individual and be yourself, but inwardly they are lost and they are wondering, do you know the word of God teaches us how to conduct our lives? It teaches us that we have purpose and we have meaning and God has a plan for you, plans of hope and a future. He has a will for your life. The, teach, the word of God teaches us all of these things. Someone once said, men don't reject the Bible because it contradicts itself. Men reject the Bible because it contradicts them. Yeah. Oh, somebody woke up. Hello. Good morning. Welcome to church. It's good to see you. Men don't reject the Bible because it contradicts itself. Men reject the Bible because it contradicts them and their lifestyles. That's why we don't read the Bible. The teachings of the Bible were not created to conform to your lifestyle. Our lifestyle should be created and designed to conform to the teachings of the Bible. And that's a huge division in the church. Because many churches, and I, I pray that this church doesn't do this, and I, I pray every week that I don't fall prey to this, but you know, sometimes we're susceptible to this. We've got to make sure that we don't preach sermons and we don't teach sermons so that we can all just apply this to our lives and that Scripture can apply to how I'm living and Scripture can apply to what I'm dealing with. And Scripture can apply. That is one way to look at Scripture, but if we really want to get to the brass tacks of what Scripture is, we should come in here saying, how can I change my life to conform to the teachings of God's Word? How can I change what I'm doing Monday through Saturday so that I conform to the teachings of what God desires for me? A great example of this is last week we looked at becoming people of mercy. And Jesus says in Matthew, he says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. And anybody, was anybody here last week? Yeah? Okay. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. There's two ways to look at that. You can say, well, you know what? I want to have mercy on me. I want God to have mercy on me, so I better be merciful to somebody else. That's one way to look at it, or, which is actually the incorrect way, or you can look at it and say, you know what? Jesus tells me that I need to be merciful, period. So I need to be merciful. That's the way to look at a scripture like that. That's the way to look at the Bible. We don't feed the Bible so we can get something out of it. 
We conform our teachings in our lives simply because it's God's word and he teaches us to do it. Now, because we obey his teachings, we are blessed. Remember in Psalms chapter one, when we do meditate on it, when we do activate it in our lives, then we shall become prosperous. Then we shall become like trees planted by streams of water. But if all you want to do is be blessed, because uh, if, you, if all you want to do is uh, be blessed or read the Bible so that you will be blessed, you kind of have it backwards. You kind of have it backwards, and I'm speaking to myself too. We simply obey the word of God uh, because it tells us to. What type of person should I marry? Have you ever asked that? So, what type of person should I marry? Do you know the Bible answers that question? Proverbs chapter 31. Men, you want to find out what type of woman you need to marry? Read Proverbs chapter 31. Women, you want to find out what kind of husband you need to be looking for? Read Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible has the answers. It teaches us how to conduct our lives. How should we manage our money? If you want to find out how you should manage your money, do you go, should you go online? Should you watch TV? Yeah, you can if you want. But, you know, Scripture teaches us in Proverbs, and Jesus teaches us how to manage our money. Did you know that? Even in the New Testament, even Paul talks about how to manage our money. How about this? Should I forgive this person? Should I seek reconciliation? Should I be the first one to make the phone call, or should I wait for them to call me? Should I do this first, or should I wait? You know, Scripture teaches about all that. Who should be the initiator? Who should be the one that makes peace? Who should uh, be the one that sits back and waits. The Bible teaches that. Divorce, the Bible teaches on that. How should we structure and conduct issues within the church? How do, how do we know if we're being biblically accurate here at Claremont or if this is just, you know, some random leader's plan and let's do this, everybody, and okay, people don't know any difference. Or are we really sticking true to what Scripture teaches us? Do you know the Bible shows us how we should conduct issues here in the church and what our mission should be? The Bible teaches us this. Here's a big one, and this is going to cause a little controversy, and some of you might disagree. Uh, but, you know, should I care what other people think about me? You should talk to your teen teenagers about this because the message today that they are getting is no. The answer is no. If you're asking yourself, should I care about what other people think about me? Some people will say, no, I shouldn't care what other people should think about me. Do you know the scripture doesn't teach that? Do you know that? Yeah, it's like really quiet in here. The scripture doesn't teach that. Now, can we control how people think about us? No, we can't control. Should we worry about controlling what other people think about us? No. Should we care what other people think about us? The answer is yes. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1, it says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. You should care about having a good reputation and a good name. 1 Timothy chapter 3 is another one. Uh, how about Matthew teaching about being the light in the darkness? You are the salt of the earth and the light in this world. We should absolutely care about what other people think. Are they seeing Jesus inside of you or are they seeing the flesh? Or are they seeing the works of darkness? And so we should care about what other people see and we should be the light. Amen? We should be the light and we should care about the fact that if we call ourselves Christians, our lives should do our best to reflect it as well. Talk is cheap. Oh, man. <laughs> what is the will of God for my life? The Bible teaches on it. The Bible teaches on it. Number three, this is a big one. There's no way I'm getting to get through this sermon. <laughs> Number three, the Bible should be used as a weapon. Did you know that? Whew. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, everyone. Ephesians chapter 6. Don't worry, I'm not going to get through all the way through it. But Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians is near the back of the Bible. If you want like kind of an acronym to help you memorize Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, go eat popcorn, right? Go eat popcorn. Go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Okay, all right. That was free. You don't have to pay for that one. The things, that, thank you, <laughs> the things they teach you in Bible college, right? All right, Ephesians 6, 13 through 17 says this. Verse 13, therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body of armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the, the peace or the gospel of peace that comes from the good news that you will be fully prepared 
In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of what, church? Faith. So that you can stop the fiery arrows of the enemy or the devil. Put on the helmet of salvation and take, here's the final one, take the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. The scripture uses this analogy. It says the word of God, that book that you're holding in your hand, in the spirit world or in the spirit realm is a sword. It's a weapon. And a sword is used to attack. A sword is used to defend all the fiery things that the enemy throws at you. It's meant to be used as a sword. You say, well, the Bible's just a history book or it's full of poetry. In Ephesians 6, it says that the word of God is a sword. And with this sword, you can defeat the enemy that is in your life that is trying to take you out. And if you didn't know that, yes, the enemy is trying to take every one of us out. And the way we defeat him is with the word of God. You can try to defeat him by going to church. You can try to defeat him by all these other things. But if you don't have the word of God in you, Monday through Saturday, the enemy will beat you up. And sometimes the enemy beats me up. And if I'm not in my word, I can stumble in here on Sunday morning and just beat up and tired and in a grumpy mood. And I'm looking at my watch. When is this going to be done? And And I'm the pastor and it's just not good. How about you? We need to have the word of God operating in our lives so that we can use it as a weapon to defeat the enemy of our souls. If you feel chained up, if you say that, you know what, you'll never break this addiction that has you. Uh, Many people have addictions that are just vices in them that they can't get rid of uh, or that you'll never get set free from depression or you'll never get set free from this or you'll never be the same person or you know what, the best is behind us. I'll never have the good days like I used to have. All of those thoughts. Do you know what? When you use the word of God as a weapon and when the enemy says you can't do this, you can say, wait just a minute. Wait just a minute. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And you defeat that, or you defeat that mentality and you defeat that uh, wrong thought in your mind. You can say in John chapter 8 verse 36, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You say, well, I'll never beat this addiction. I'll never beat this vice. It's killing me. It's always going to be in my life. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You need to pray that God sets you free. If you're listening and entertaining lies like you're not valuable to God or that God somehow made a mistake with you or you're in the wrong family and you're not really even supposed to be here on this planet and you're just a oops baby. There are no oops babies in God's word. You're not a mistake. You do have purpose. You can use the word as a sword and say in Psalms 139, it says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that God has a plans and he has plans of hope and a future for me. Jeremiah 29, 11. You use that to defeat the enemy of your soul. If you're listening to lies like you'll never make it, you can't do it. You're in this transition and you don't know if you can get on the other side of this. You don't know if you're going to survive or you'll ever get through this. You can use the scripture, Isaiah 54, that says, No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. All those who rise up against me, they are going to be the ones that fall. How about Joshua chapter Chapter 1, be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. You can use scripture as a weapon. How about if you're using or you're believing this lie that you're not loved or that what you have done angers God? And you know the sin that you did 10 years ago? You're really not forgiven over that. And you listen to the lies of the enemy. You know what you did last week? You know what you did this morning? What you said this morning? God is putting a check mark by your name. And he's angry at you. And he's mad at you that you haven't been in church since 1922. And he's mad at you that this. And he's angry. And he's holding this grudge against you. You can say, you know what? Wait just a minute. Wait just a minute. I am loved by God. Scripture says in Romans chapter 8 verse 38. I am convinced, Paul says, I am convinced that neither height, nor death, nor anything, nor principalities, nor uh, things in the past, or nor things in the present, nor demons, nor angels, uh, anything will, in all of creation will be able to separate me from the love of God. Nothing. In Spanish, that word says nada. Nada. I'm convinced that nada, nothing, will separate me from the love that God has for me. Nothing at all. It's all a matter of if we're using this scripture as a weapon or does this just sit on our shelf as a history book? Because the Bible says that we should use it as a weapon and it's a sword. Number four, the Bible feeds our soul. When we, when we use the word of God as a weapon, 
and we really meditate on this, it feeds our souls. You can depend on it. You can use it. Psalms 119, verse 114. You are my refuge and my shield. It says this, God, your word is my source of hope. Hope is not wishful thinking. The Bible is not just a bunch of rhetoric by people who created it many years ago. It is your source of hope. It feeds your soul. My question for you, friend, is how is your soul doing this morning? What are you using to feed your soul? Are we using uh, food? Are we using TV? Are we using entertainment? Are we using sports? Are we using uh, vacations? Are we using money? Are we using shopping cards? Are we using uh, all these other things? Because the real stuff that feeds your soul, it's God's word, and it's found in this book. According to David in Psalms 23, that when he's in the book, that the Lord is the one that fills his cup, and his cup overflows when he is focusing on the Lord, his shepherd. Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. What do you use to feed your soul? Every bottle has a bottom to that bottle. Every other temporary fix eventually ends. That's why they call it temporary. <laughs> what is it that lasts forever? Well, that's funny. The word of God says the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Forever. Uh, I have this book. Is there anybody in here that wants to uh, be super honest and just say, you know what? Man, I need some more hope in my life. I, I'm living down here. God calls me to live up here. I could just use some more hope and some more victory in my life right now. Would anybody be willing to raise their hand? With, I mean, if we're all honest, we'd all raise our hands. But anybody, who is that back there? I can't see. Is that Ashley? Yeah, Ashley, here's a book for you. This is God's inspirational promise book. It's written by Max Lucado. It has hundreds of promises in it for your hope. Ashley, Lord be with you. Word of God is powerful, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. I don't have time to finish the rest of the sermon. So uh, why don't we stand together? Man, I'd love to go to this, but I can't. All right. How, do you, how are you transformed? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? You accept the Bible's authority. Be transformed through the Holy Spirit. Learn what the Bible is about. I might continue this. I'm not sure. Not today, but obey what the Bible says. So let's have the worship team come forward. Father, we just come before you this morning asking you to put a stronger conviction in our lives for the Word of God. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would transform us through the word of God, but give us the conviction that we need to read it, to memorize it, to use it as a weapon. I pray, Lord, if there's anybody in here this morning who hasn't read their word at all this week, I pray that when they leave here, you will show them that they need to get into the word of God so that you can operate in their lives and speak to them, Lord. You would long to be with us and you long to speak to us and help us do that through your word. I also pray against a spirit of condemnation. I, I pray that people will not feel condemned and that they will understand that, God, you don't hold a ruler stick over us, but you, you want to set us free. You care and love about us so much that you desire to speak to us, and that's why you've given us your word. So help us, Lord. Help us to be transformed through the word of God. Help us to be obedient to your word and help us know that you are speaking through your word. I pray that somebody today uh, becomes at least more wise or more strengthened, more equipped in their Christian foundation, that they know why they believe what they believe and that the word of God is accurate and it's inspired. I pray that in Jesus' name, all God's people say, amen. Amen. amen.